Hey Axis and Allies players, the good captain here. Welcome to video number 7 in my Axis and Allies 1914 series. This video is the United Kingdom's strategic video. The UK is 5th in turn sequence order to go, and it is by far the most powerful of the Entente players. Not only does it have the highest starting income for the Entente, but it has a significant number of armies up and down Africa. It has some naval power in the Mediterranean. It has significant land armies on the United Kingdom and Canada. And last, and probably most important, the UK is unique in that it has a second production center, and that's here in India. It also has the power with the most by way of responsibilities. Not only are we going to be the primary power responsible for clearing out Africa, but for protecting it as well. The UK is also essentially the sole power responsible for disposing of the Ottoman Empire. And finally, there's an expectation to help out in France as well. It's for these reasons that I feel the most experienced player on the side of the Entente should take the UK. So I've decided to break this video up into three segments. First, I'm going to discuss what to do in Africa. Then we're going to move to a discussion on India and what to do in the Middle East. And finally, we'll close the discussion on what to do in the Atlantic and the Mediterranean. But first, let's cover the first turn purchase. My preferred first turn purchase for the UK is 4 infantry, 3 artillery, and 1 fighter. This entire purchase is going to deploy to India, but I'll talk more about that when we get to that segment in the video. The first thing to note about Africa is that a lot of what the British should or shouldn't do on their first turn is going to be dictated by what the Germans did. For the sake of flow, I've gone ahead and set up what I feel is the most efficient German opener, and that's having the German troop from German East Africa and Cameroon meet in Belgian Congo, and the troop in Togoland taking over Nigeria. So I'm going to play the British against this setup, but no matter where the German pieces have moved, I feel that there's some general guidelines to follow, and I'll go over those as I move through this British counter strategy. One of the themes that I like to keep in mind as the British is that of containment. The end is inevitable for these five German pieces down here, but if we fail to give them their due respect, they can be quite a headache in the mid-game. So with that in mind, if I were facing this German opener as the British player, the first thing I would do is move this infantry in Rhodesia down to the Union of South Africa. Next, I'm going to move this infantry in British East Africa into German East Africa. Next, I'm going to bring at least one artillery and one infantry from Egypt to Anglo-Egypt Sudan. And finally, we're going to load two infantry from India onto the transport in C-Zone 29, move that down to C-Zone 26, and then load into German East Africa. We're going to look something like this at the end of the first turn. One other theme I like to keep in mind, no matter where the Germans have moved, is keeping a ratio of about two to one. In other words, I like to have about two British pieces for every one German piece down here in Africa. Now currently we have nine pieces committed. If I was going to commit a tenth, I would bring another infantry into Anglo-Egypt Sudan. And from this position, no matter where the Germans move, whether they combine in Angola, combine in Cameroon, stay put or spread out, we're in a very good position to destroy German pieces that are left on their own, or just tighten the noose in general. And this is the goal. We want to first contain the Germans, then contract their perimeter, and then as quickly and cleanly as possible, remove them from the board. And this leads me to the other important point about being the British down in Africa. This transport. Take a moment to notice that there are only two territories in Africa that don't border a sea zone. This means that the Germans are going to be highly exposed to attacks from the ocean. And in most games, if I can, I'll move the British battleship down to sea zone 26. The condition under which I might not move this battleship down is if the Austrians are still in force in Sea Zone 17 and one of the other Entente navies doesn't have a plan to destroy them, but we'll get to that in a moment. With this UK opener complete, the Germans' days are numbered here, and a reasonable expectation is to see the elimination of all German forces in Africa by turns 3, 4, or 5 at the latest. You should be looking to pick off vulnerable units in future turns or otherwise contract that perimeter until the last German pocket of resistance is crushed. This usually occurs down here, either in Southwest Africa, Union of South Africa, or sometimes Rhodesia. 
And then the best thing to do is simply walk back up to Egypt and definitely use this transport to help expedite pieces back to more relevant fronts. We'll now move to the discussion on India and the fight against the Ottomans. After the transport has taken two infantry and moved south, we're going to take the four remaining infantry in India and two artillery and attack Afghanistan. Afghanistan is guarded by a single infantry and artillery, and there's an 83% chance that the UK secures this territory in one round of combat. And they'll most likely take a single casualty, so we have three infantry and two artillery remaining. I'm going to go ahead now and reset the battleship, and then we'll discuss naval options. So as mentioned earlier, if you can get away with it, you want to move the battleship in C-Zone 29 down to C-Zone 26 to help clear Africa. However, if the Central Powers openers went quite well, and it looks like they need some help out in the Mediterranean, a good move could be to consolidate the fleet in C-Zone 28. With everybody consolidated here, we can still project our power south with a transport and a battleship on the following turn if the Mediterranean clears up. Or if the French and Italians need some help, this is a perfectly capable fleet to go out and do some damage to either the Ottomans, the Austrians, or both. I'll briefly mention Arabia here. When it comes to Arabia, I generally do not activate this, at least not on the first turn. The reason being is that the Ottomans have 18 attack points adjacent to this territory, so moving in one piece still means the likely destruction of all three if the Ottomans decide to attack. I don't think it's an outright bad move, it's just not one I'm too keen on. So as mentioned in the purchase units phase, all of the new units are going to go to India. That's four infantry, three artillery, and a fighter. And then of course we're setting up to attack Persia on turn two. We're not obligated to attack Persia on the next turn, we're just setting up a very strong attack to do so, if the opportunity presents itself. If Persia is not secured by turn two, you definitely want it secured by turn three, so that we can begin grinding down this territory right here, Mesopotamia. And for the British on this area of the board, this is the mid-game goal, to break down this territory. Mesopotamia won't fall until around turn 6, 7, or even 8. There'll be a wider discussion of this defense as the Ottomans in the Ottoman video, but on a long enough timeline there'll be enough force coming out of India that the weaker Ottoman economy will force them to fall back. The breaking down of Mesopotamia is the United Kingdom's mid-game goal in this area of the board. The long and end-game goal, of course, is to gobble up all of these Ottoman territories and eventually make an assault into Constantinople itself. Before we leave this area of the board, one last point of discussion is the responsibility of the British to maintain control of Africa via Egypt. A sharp-eyed Ottoman player will notice and take advantage of any weakness that the British leave open for them. Keeping a healthy amount of British pieces here in Egypt protects the breadbasket that is Africa. Bottom line up front, you don't want any significant Ottoman force to break through into this area of the board. The situation for the Entente can become nightmarish if that happens. And as we transition to the final segment of this video, a discussion on the Atlantic and Mediterranean, I'm going to show you a cheap and easy way to keep Egypt reinforced with British pieces. A discussion of British strategy in the Mediterranean, the Atlantic, and on the Western Front is almost always going to be one of mid- and long-range strategy. And this is because, as stated in previous videos, I believe that a competent Central Powers player will attack C-Zone 9 and 2 as the German player, and in the majority of cases the Germans will win each of those battles. It is certainly possible that some British ships can survive this onslaught, but for purposes of this demonstration we're going to assume the worst has happened, and there are no British ships in the Atlantic. We're also going to assume that the French have retrograded their fleet to C-Zone 2, cleared the German boats therein, and so we look something like this going into round 2. And finally, as stated in the French video, one of the main goals of the Entente is to clear the oceans of Central Powers warships as quickly as possible. There's plenty of firepower to do the job, it's simply a matter of time, patience, and coordination. And so as soon as that time comes, as soon as it's possible, I feel the British should be looking to set up the Canada to Egypt pipeline. This is a transport shuck strategy that takes advantage of the geography of the map and seems to heavily favor the British. 
And at a bare minimum, it requires the British to have at least one transport in the Atlantic and at least one transport in the Mediterranean. And once we have these transports safely in place, we can begin the shuck. So the first turn that this kicks off, we're going to see this British transport pick up two pieces off of Wales and move south to sea zone 14 to unload those two pieces into Spanish Morocco. Then on the following turn, this transport will shuck between 16 and 17, picking up the two pieces in Spanish Morocco and depositing them in Egypt. While this transport shucks between sea zone 2 and 14, bringing in two new fresh troops. You can keep this shuck running so long as there are troops in Canada. And at the point that those troops run out, the United Kingdom may want to purchase another transport, place it in C zone 8, and from turn to turn, flip it with the one in C zone 14 to keep that supply going. Now expanding this Canada to Egypt pipeline from a double shuck to a triple shuck that connects the United Kingdom is an option, but not a rule. Which leads me to my final point of discussion, and that is what to do with the British troops in Britain itself. The UK player should be looking to help out France out on the West Front just as soon as possible. And in my experience as the Entente, the French player will really appreciate at least two British infantry a turn, starting on or around turn three or after. I think the most efficient use of UK troops on the West Front are as meat shields for the French army. As stated in the French video, France has the largest land army in Europe and sending those troops across to absorb hits really helps preserve the French combat power. So whatever decision is made with these troops, that is whether to send them south and then towards the Ottomans, or whether to send them across the channel, one last theme to keep in mind is the UK is you really don't want to be spending a lot of money on new naval units up here. In fact, ideally, you'd really like to buy the fewest amount of transports you can, and otherwise let the other Entente navies clean out the remaining Central Powers fleets. In fact, the UK can get away in this area of the board without really building any transports. If they really want to be frugal and focus on the Ottoman Empire, they can use the French transports to step into Sea Zone 8 and 9, and simply land bridge United Kingdom troops across the channel and into France. So whatever decisions you decide to make with any of the troops in this area of the board as the United Kingdom, I feel very strongly about reinforcing this guideline. The United Kingdom is uniquely positioned to crush the Ottoman Empire and to protect the breadbasket of Africa. And therefore I feel that the focus of this power should be in the southeast corner of the map, and it is most efficient to play a supporting role as the UK on the Western Front. Okay, the time has now come to close this video. This was the United Kingdom's strategic video. This is the most dynamic power of the Entente players. We started this video by discussing opening moves in Africa, and what I think is the most efficient way to remove the German troops from down there. We then moved to a discussion on opening moves out of India, the options available to the UK fleet in the East, the importance of protecting Egypt, and finally that the UK bears the responsibility of crushing the Ottoman Empire. And I feel that a reasonable timeline to be outside of Constantinople is on or around turn 10. And finally, in the discussion on what to do with the British in the Mediterranean, the Atlantic, and out on the West Front, we discussed logistical and economic decisions, namely the shuck options available to the UK, the opportunity to use French transports as cheap stepping stones to get British troops into France, and the role that they play out on the West Front, namely as meat shields for the French. And despite the many responsibilities of this power, the main goal is to swing a hammer through Mesopotamia all the way to and through Constantinople to get into the central powers from the south. That's all for this video. Thanks for watching this. All the best from the good captain and bye bye.